The next bill we'll do is bill number 656 uh, by Senator Conley. Um, we have Patrick Quinlan, uh, Marcella Betancourt, uh, and Matthew Lenz. Mr. Quinlan, good evening and welcome. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'm here today on behalf of uh, a group of my clients, the uh, anesthesiologists, the radiologists, the dentists, and the oral surgeons, and we oppose the bill uh, as worded that's before you today. Uh, in order to explain our opposition, I think I, since this committee does have a fair number of lawyers on it, and that's not a bad thing, um, if, if you were to get a call tonight at uh, 9 o'clock and a client says to you that there's two, there are two men at the door and they would like to search my house. Um, what do you think I should do? I think most lawyers, it would almost be malpractice not to say it, uh, the five words, do they have a warrant? Um, so if they don't have a warrant and you refuse them entry, if they came back and said, well, can we go into your medicine cabinet and see what drugs you're taking? Uh, again, I think my advice would be, do you have a warrant? The problem with this bill, um, it attempts to address a problem uh, and by creating a new violation of our privacy rights. The way the law is worded, it would allow the Attorney General's office or any law enforcement agency, once they have an individual who has taken a course uh, in drug diversion, to be able to use the prescription uh, monitoring database. The purpose of this database is essentially, and, and fundamentally, if you look in the statute, the original statute, as well as in the Department of Health's uh, write-up on it, the purpose of it is it is supposed to be a tool for the doctors to be able to look at a patient, first, and see if there are interaction issues, secondly, to see whether or not that patient may be a drug seeker. And what this bill does, it destroys, it gets between that relationship between the patient um, and their doctor. Uh, all of the healthcare groups that I represent oppose this. It's, you know, I think our, forefound, our forefathers were right in 1789 when they adopted the Bill of Rights, when they adopted the Fourth Amendment, that you would be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. If the Attorney General or any law enforcement officer wants information on uh, either prescriptions that are contained in the database or other healthcare information, they are required to get a subpoena. Uh, or to get a warrant from a court. To just take that waiver away and just have that they can put a number on a piece of paper and go into any one of your prescriptions that you've received or any citizen in your community has received is an overreach. And particularly in light, if you take a look at the data that the health department does a very good job on, apparently 100% of the prescribers are now enrolled in the database, so they're getting a, a pretty good picture of what's going on. Uh, but if you look at the data, the data that's going on in Rhode Island in terms of overdoses, the overdoses are not uh, overdose of prescription drugs. For the most part, on almost a two-to-one ratio, they are fentanyl overdoses. And that's a serious problem, and I know the AG's office and law enforcement is doing the best they can with this problem. But, you know, I think when you look at how sensitive this information is under HIPAA, uh, it's it's considered to be PHI or personal health information. It is some of the most highly protected information that you can have. And again, if it is that important that they need access, there are a number of avenues within HIPAA itself that they could use uh, in an emergency situation without a warrant. But to allow every law enforcement person who takes a course to be able to sift through that database is a gross uh, invasion of people's privacy rights, and we think it, it erodes and deteriorates a relationship between the doctor and the patient, and it makes the patient more reluctant to go to the doctor. If they know that, uh, if they feel the police are going to be sorting through this, the patient may choose to just get it on the street and buy it that way. Uh, another very brief, brief point is, if we're looking at this issue, um, it's it affects the providers too, because the provider, when you, when you write a prescription to a patient, this law requires now that you advise the patient that that information will go into the prescription monitoring database. Uh, and if you don't advise the patient of that, you're responsible for attorney's fees and punitive damages under the existing law. 
are docs now to tell the patients that, by the way, it not only goes in the prescription database, but any law enforcement officer who takes a course at the police academy is going to be able to sort through that data. I know it's well-meaning, and I know you're doing your best to deal with the issues from our opioid crisis, our fentanyl crisis, but I think at the end of the day, it is too much of an ask to take away the privacy rights of all of the citizens in your constituents in order to make it a little bit easier for law enforcement. I mean, the AG's office is probably less than a football field away from the courthouse. If they need a warrant, they can walk down the street and get a warrant if it's that significant. And judges regularly grant warrants when there's probable cause. That's our system. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Senator Archambault. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that Chairman Miller should really be commended for his passion at being at the forefront of Chairman advocacy. Miller wants to get in the line of the oh, camera now here. since he he's came here. in. <laughs> my, my man, he's here. So I think really, and I say this sincerely, he really needs to be commended for his passion and being a, a legislative trailblazer at the, getting these bills forth and getting behind them to effectuate the change we need to deal with, all the things that you've said in this opioid addictive uh, climate. That said, uh, this is, and I like all the bills he's put forth, except this one. This one makes the hair stand up in the back of my neck solely for the fact that the, the Fourth Amendment's involved here. And, you know, you have a REOP, a reasonable expectation of privacy in your home. And so I, for the life of me, can't understand why I'd want to get that fundamental right, almost an inviolate right to me, uh, that we've come so far from, as you aptly put it, Pat, from the Crown, you know, why would we ever want to erode that to a law enforcement officer based on a subjective women caprice, no matter how laudable the motives are? So that part of it really just unplugs me right away, and I just wanted to share that. Thank you. I guess I don't need to respond to that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Marcella, good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Um, we... I, the ACL, in behalf of the ACLU, we completely uh, we oppose this legislation as well for the reasons that were mentioned earlier. Um, a few years ago, the General Assembly uh, set protections for <clears throat> the this database, and this legislation specifically wants to overhaul those protections. As was mentioned earlier, uh, if a police officer comes into your home and wants to look into your medicine cabinet, the first thing that you would ask them to do is for a warrant. And that is specifically what we're doing. Um, we understand that the opioid crisis is something to be worried about. Nevertheless, if it, an investigation is valid, we also agree that a warrant ser simply serves as an independent check for the valid validity of the investigation. Um, that law enforcement has enough information to look into the private information of an individual. Um, as was mentioned earlier, an individual with chronic pain shouldn't be afraid to have to go to their doctor uh, at a, or expect a police officer outside of their home simply for taking medication to make them feel better. <clears throat> So while the bill requires that um, any police investigation uses the database, has a case number, and that the investigation can be performed by a certified investigator, <clears throat> these provisions are simply a window dressing for nothing, uh, for simply uh, for not protecting the privacy of an individual. So we urge you to, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. We urge it's you. It's late. Thank We're, you. We all are. <laughs> Thank any you. questions or comments for this witness? Matt? Good evening and welcome, and good luck. Woman, members of the committee, uh, I'd like to clarify a bunch of points I think were misrepresented by Mr. Quinlan. Uh, first, it, well, Senator Miller is a, spo a sponsor, but he's not the primary sponsor. My grandmother will point that out. It's all good. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I first want to delve into why this legislation is put forward. Prior to 2013, law enforcement, the DEA, the, uh, our Medicaid fraud unit, would be able to access the PDMP system if it was in relation to a bona fide investiga investigation. What that meant is the lowest standard of probable cause, but you still had to prove that there was some connection there. Um, in 2013, that changed. Which I don't know specifically why that changed, but it required the search warrant that, at that point. That significantly has hampered our investigations of pill mills and people who go doctor shopping, take those and, and sell drugs to the street. A lot of people are overdosing on opioids. We have an opioid epidemic, and it starts with those prescription pills. Research shows that. 
Um, so what this bill does is it tries to, at first, it tried to go back to the pre-2013. We actually did a bill last year that was just in relation to a bona fide investigation, the same standard, and there were some concerns about that, about who would have access, too many people having access. So we went back. We went to uh, Brandeis, which does a center of excellence on PDMP, their national standard. We looked at our neighbor, Massachusetts, which this legislation is based upon and is currently in law and not being challenged constitutionally. And, uh, and we based this law on that. I want to get to the constitutional part of this. There's no Fourth Amendment violation here. The Supreme Court has held, the Supreme Court of the United States in Wayland versus Roe, that this is a reasonable exercise of state's broad police power for a state statute to require a copy of prescription drugs. It's a controlled substance. That was then extended in the case of New York versus Berger, also in the Supreme Court. And then it was extended here in the Superior Court, State v. Underwood, where, I quote, Rhode Island requiring that prescription records be open to inspection to public officers or employees engaged in enforcing the Controlled Substance Act of Rhode Island further undermines defendant's implicit argument that he had a reasonable expectation of privacy protected by the Fourth Amendment. This is constitutional. What we're doing does not invade on anybody's Fourth Amendment rights. To say that is to, is, is to disregard case law. The Supreme Court's already ruled on this. There's one case in the Ninth Circuit that has been appealed in the, in the uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, the Attorney General, U.S. Attorney's Office that we spoke to feels very comfortable that they're going to win the appeal where this subject is being debated. But as I said, there's plenty of case law that supports it. What this bill does is not to search somebody's uh, you know, kitchen cabinet or bathroom cabinet. What this bill does is trying to stop pill mills and stop doctor shoppers from taking these pills and killing people on the streets. Further, I want to bring something else up, too. I appreciate the privacy concerns. I was in House Judiciary last night supporting an internet privacy bill. We were on the same side for once. It was great. Um, but, but what I'd like to see, and I'm going to open, I'm going to extend this olive branch once again, as I did when this was heard in the House, that the doctor's groups come to us. Maybe we can work together and figure out a way to uh, stop overprescribing. Because I want to let you all know, and these, these are proven statistics, by the National Safety Council, 99% of doctors are over-prescribing prescription medications on a, on a poll that they did. The CDC recommends a uh, three dosage limit. They're, they're going way above that. Uh, the opioid epidemic, the, the amount of prescription uh, painkillers that have been described since 1999 to 2010 has quadrupled. And I have a, a one last factoid I, I, wanna, I wanna say to you about that. The amount of prescription. Matt, Matt yes. let me interrupt you for a second. Are you saying that those cases that you quoted that I, I don't have before me, you cite it, yep. are exactly on point with this bill? Not, not exactly on point, no, but it goes right, so let to. Let me stop you yep. for a second. Let me stop you for a second. That's where you unplug me right there. Because when you say, and you're very passionate tonight, Matt, you're on fire, okay? And you're doing a fine job. But when you say that there's absolutely no issue with Fourth Amendment rights and reasonable expectation of privacy, when you're going to let the government peer into your medicine cabinet through your HIPAA laws, and we think there's such an urgency that if we don't do that, all the world's going to fall down, I, for the life of me, don't get any of that. Now, I sponsored a bill, and it's in this session, to require doctors to advise patients before they prescribe them opioids and give them alternative uh, uh, methods of treatment. I'm with you, hook, line, and sinker when it comes to what we do to address the opioid addiction by a plethora of bills that are going to try to do that. But saying that the Fourth Amendment, man, yeah, you're an attorney, and I'm not making this personal, but the Fourth Amendment, that should be, when you go to law school, what do they hammer? The Fourth Amendment. When you're in a constitutional law class, what do they hammer? The Fourth Amendment. You could be a property lawyer, a civil lawyer, a criminal lawyer. You're going to come out of there with a comprehension, at least generally, that we ran from the crown so that they wouldn't come into our house and bust the door open and knock our heads in. And getting the ability to peer into the medicine cabinet through no warrant is something that really makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck. It's getting late and I've talked enough. May, may I respond to that, Chairwoman? Can I just respond to that quickly? Yeah. And, I, and I appreciate that, uh, Vice Chair uh, Archibald. But the Supreme Court has, has ruled, the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that prescription drugs don't have the same reasonable expectation of privacy that other actions do because it's a controlled substance. It's within the state police powers. That's their decision, not my own point of view. Within, I have, can I ask a question? Yep. Within HIPAA or within the Fourth Amendment? 
within the Fourth Amendment. Okay. So what about? I mean, I would I would imagine that HIPAA would cover whatever drug has been. Pre- and I I'm actually breaking my own rule by belaboring this point. But what I perhaps would suggest is that um, p- perhaps you get to us any distinct or maybe Mr. Delora is a better person to ask to do this but any distinguishing features between the statute that you've presented to us and and the case law of Mr. Quinlan whoever um, wants to do it but I f- have a feeling we could argue about this all night because that's quite frankly what we do and I've been begging them not to argue with you for the last 10 minutes but Senator Lombardi is going to jump in and give us I, I, I'm not going to argue but uh, you know uh, Whenever I hear that a case is distinguishable, then I want to read those cases. Yep. So I'm going to ask that you provide us with those cases. Absolutely. So we can take a look at them. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? May Senator just, Metz. Just, uh, I was sick a few weeks ago, so they gave me some cough medicine. I had to show my license, and I had to sign. Now, uh, that list... Who 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 gets that list? That's that's what I'm curious. About. No, no, it it would have to be in connection still with a with an investigation. It has to it still seeks approval from the Department of Health over the the course. So no, I'm just saying. So so the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 pharmacy, the pharmacy that I go to. Yep. They they they're keeping they're keeping records. Correct. All yes. Right? So they're keeping records. So if there is a doctor that's over prescribing, how is all that police? They're just keeping it to be keeping it. It must that data must somebody must be using that data. I'm 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 curious now. Uh, what is that what is that data? So the data ends up in the system and it's supposed to be utilized by doctors, pharmacists, it's to to to, to prevent, you know, doctor shopping. Uh, it, it's so for example, like a doctor can check the PDMP to see if you've been to six other doctors to uh to uh get Vicodin, oxycodone. Um, so it's still it is being utilized by folks, correct? Being utilized by doctors and doctors, pharmacists. I think others have access to under the electric uh, ele- under the database. I would have to pull it to see. Yeah, Senator Lombardi. I'm sorry. Uh, I my concern now, and, and again, I at the risk of getting the ire of the chair now that I'm opening my mouth, but but. Senator Metz's cough medicine prescription that he just talked about goes into a database. No question about that. Senator Metz, by his own admission tonight, said he's 69 years old. So that means that he is Medicare eligible. If a doctor is being investigated for Medicare fraud, inevitably it may trigger Mr. Uh, Senator, Mr. Senator Metz has right to privacy in that case. So not only the doctor that's being investigated, but the patient whose information is within that database. And that's what's troubling. It, l- let me finish, Matt. Oh, and what, what further troubles me is, is the title that we're giving to this individual. And it becomes, uh, and I want to get it right, certified... Qualify? No, I'm sorry. The the investigator. What is he? He's a certified, certified something. He's a certified law enforcement prescription drug diversion investigator. Okay. Well, if that doesn't raise uh, some some doubt in your mind, just his name alone it, it is troubling to me. Just his title, her title. I shouldn't say that. I have two daughters. Her title alone can be troubling to me. And under the guise of law enforcement undertaking perhaps arguably a civil investigation may lead to criminal investigations and, and, and Senator Metz's expectation of privacy in that case. So I'm a little troubled by this. I really want to see these cases you're talking what about. I, what I, quite frankly, I, the more everyone's talking, the more questions I have. And so what I would suggest, and I know Mr. DeLauro is still signed up to testify, um, but I think that to, to even discuss this bill further, I think that we have to have some very serious discussions about definitions and what... I, it's raising questions for me as to what types of investigations, quite frankly, they're looking at, and are these going to be um, confined just to these drug houses that you're talking about, or if somebody's being investigated for, let's say, some sort of campaign finance violation, are they then going to get access into into the drug database to see if they can get into somebody's house some other way? But this is, I grew up in a house with a bunch of defense lawyers, so I think 
very strangely uh, sometimes. Understandable. So understandable. having that, having, you know, said all of that, I think it's very clear that at least for the time being that we're going to need to hold this so we can work out whatever issue. And I feel bad for you, quite frankly, no. that everybody's attacking you. <laughs> but no, no. And, and I, I just want to, <laughs> it's what I get paid to do, I guess. Um, and Joey comes back next week, so she can have the tough week next week. Um, and, I, and I just want to end with this. We are willing to work with anybody. The, 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 I guess the part that um, makes me so fired up is because we offer to work with folks, and then they just don't want to work with us. They just want to say, oh, no privacy, and, and that's it. So I, I just want to uh, throw that out there that we're willing to work with anybody. Thank you. Well, um, the, good, well, the, good thing, the good thing, Matt, is you, you got a medicine cabinet like the rest of us. I sure do. <laughs> sure do. May I Mr. Just, Quinlan, yes. qu very quickly. Very quickly. Um, you know, the search for pill mills, we agree there should be efforts to shut down pill mills. We also agree on doctor shopping. The health department, last year you gave them power to do analytics of it, to be able to identify these, and there's nothing in there that prevents the health department saying, look at Dr. Smith, look at Dr. Jones. He issued, you know, 9,000 prescriptions last month. Second issue is last year also in the opioid uh, crisis package you passed, one of the bills you passed were specifically regulating the amount that one can prescribe. So if someone is prescribing beyond those limits and they were just enacted into the regulations, which the Senate and House asked them to do, so there are, uh, was it minimum more, I mean, uh, morphine equivalency units, and that's the max, and they, every doc has to check before they issue a prescription has to go to the database to see if it's a drug seeker, um, and they get letters from the database that you saw a patient who is a drug seeker. They don't tell them who, but they will tell the doc, and the doc can then go up and check their schedule. So there are very good controls put in place already by the health department. It's my recollection that in the House, the health department opposed the proposed legislation, which I believe is identical to what's before this committee. I oh, certainly will. Thank you. The last witness we have signed up to testify uh, on this is Mike DeLauro from the public I made no such promise. I said he, te he signed up. Mr. DeLauro. Oh, I was checking off the things that I was going to say, listening to Mr. Quinlan, and I checked them all off, and I only have two things to say to you ton tonight that hasn't been said. Um, we have a very proud uh, history in Rhode Island um, in protecting this type, type of information. Uh, Article 1, Section 6 of the Rhode Island Constitution is substantially different than its federal counterpart in the Fourth Amendment. For example, it's our search warrants have, must describe, quote, as nearly as may be the uh, area to be searched and what is to be searched for. And we were also, we have a statute, uh, 91925, which uh, is a statutory exclusionary rule, um, which really implements Article 1, Section 6. Um, and that, that statute was adopted by this and enacted by this body uh, quite a few years before MAP versus Ohio, which was the case that really established the exclusionary rule. So I, while well, I have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, Mr. Lenz, um, and I'll just say one last thing. I remember the hearings on this bill back in 2013, and I'd be willing, boy, I, I seem to recall that uh, those of us who came in and opposed it, and there were a lot of us, were assured that there were protections in this bill that, um, that would protect us. Um, and I'm concerned now hearing that, well, we don't really don't want to go to the trouble of getting warrants. Well, you know, things are tough sometimes. The last, absolutely last thing I'm going to say is I'm in deep, deep trouble on this one because I keep all my medications on my bureau so they're all in plain view. So when the, <laughs> so when the cops come in, I'm, in, I'm you know, I'm, I'm dead to rights. Thank you. With that, Senator Archibald moves to hold for further study. Seconded by Senator Lombardi. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed. The bill's held. Yes. The next bill uh, is uh, Chairman Conley, Bill 656. Uh, Senator Jabor moves that we indefinitely postpone Bill 656 and bring before it Bill 656, Substitute A. Seconded by Sec Senator Archibald. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed. The Substitute A uh, is properly before us. Uh, the Substitute A uh, contains uh, some language that was submitted by the Attorney uh, General's Office um, 
and made the bill, uh, quite frankly, uh, a much better bill. Uh, Senator Archambault moves passage, seconded by Senator Jabor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, uh, the bill passes. We move to item number three on today's calendar is S656 sub A by Senator Conley, an act relating to the Food and Drugs Uniform Controlled Substance Act. Senator Conley. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. This bill will allow uh, certain limited information contained in the prescription drug monitoring database to be disclosed to a certified law enforcement drug diversion investigator of a qualified law enforcement agency who has completed a, cert a certification course approved by the director of the Department of Health and certified by the Police Officers Commission on Standards and Training. Um, I, move, I move passage, and at the appropriate time, I have an amendment. Senator Conley moves the act. Is there a second? Second by Senator McCaffrey, Senator Lynch Prada, uh, Senator Gallo, Senator Chacon, Senator Goodwin, Senator Lombardi, Senator Coyne, and Senator De Palma. Discussion on the act. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, you have an amendment, Senator Conley. Uh, the amendment, Mr. President, um, it's LC001229 uh, backslash 3. Um, I hereby move to amend 2017 uh, S05, uh, excuse me, 0656 substitute A, entitled an act relating to Food and Drugs Uniform Controlled Substances Act, as follows. On page 12, line 11, after the language January 1, 2018, by adding the following language, and the amendments hereto shall expire on January 1, 2023. In essence, this creates a five-year sunset provision. Senator Colling moves the amendment. Is there a second? Second by Senator McCaffrey, Senator Lynch, Prada, Senator Lombardi. Is there discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, the clerk will unlock the machine. If all senators have registered to vote, the clerk will lock the machine. There are 27 votes in the affirmative, eight in the negative, and the amendment passes. On the act as amended. Senator Conley moves the act as amended. Is there a second? Second by Senator Chacon, Senator Lombardi, Senator Gallo, Senator McCaffrey, Senator Coyne. Senator Lynch Prado, is there discussion on the act as amended? Senator Conley? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to take this uh, uh, opportunity to address some of the concerns uh, that have been raised regarding this bill. Uh, the opioid addiction epidemic is Rhode Island's greatest public health crisis. In 2016, there were 336 accidental overdoses in the state of Rhode Island, up from 310 the year before. In the first three months of 2017, there have been 81 more deaths. Among the many adverse impacts that we all have experienced, there's probably nobody in this chamber that doesn't have a family or friend that's been affected by this crisis. We saw in an article in the Providence Journal that even funeral homes business is changing. What's the difference? They have never seen so many parents burying their children before. Last year, the Senate passed a package of 10 bills specifically targeting this crisis. We did that because we wanted to save lives. I remember going home that evening and telling my wife and kids that I probably had the most satisfying, important day I'd ever experienced as a senator because I felt that I had genuinely participated in a process that was going to save lives of children in the state of Rhode Island. What this bill does is it, it addresses the prescription drug monitoring program. 
The goal of the, of the bill is to put more feet on the ground in confronting this crisis. We need every strategy conceivable in order to save lives. I believe this will assist us in two ways. It will help us investigate the criminal drug prescribing that is in part the genesis of this crisis. And secondly, what flows from that? The illegal prescription drug diversion that gets those opioids onto the street and into the hands of our children. The facts and data, those deaths, tell us that we are not yet doing enough to stop opioids from being diverted through the prescription system into those streets and into the hands of our children. Rhode Island currently has a statutory search warrant requirement that was enacted into law in 2013. There are 30 states that do not require a search warrant. And a little perspective is helpful. In 2013, the change to require a search warrant was not in response to any demonstrated abuse by law enforcement. Instead, those changes to the PDMP were proposed were a result of additional data being put into the system at that time. There was opposition to the inclusion of that additional information in the system. And the statutory search warrant requirement was a part of that give and take. Now, privacy concerns are important. And access to treatment is critical, and it has to be a part of the strategy. I don't want to sponsor a bill that would compromise those privacy concerns or compromise access to treatment. So unlike last year's version of the bill, significant safeguards have been added. First of all, the bill limits disclosure to the drug diversion investigators of the FDA, the DEA, the FBI, the OIG, and the Attorney General's very limited medical, <clears throat> excuse me, Medicaid fraud unit. Local law enforcement and state police here in Rhode Island will still need a warrant to access any information in the system. But even access for those agencies and those specialized investigators from those specialized programs is still not direct. There will be no direct access by any law enforcement at all. The Department of Health is still the gatekeeper. In addition to that, not only do the requests have to go through the Department of Health, but there are two circumstances in which we, gave that gate, we give that gatekeeper essentially veto authority. If a law enforcement agency fails to return verification information that will now be required in this statute, then the director of the Department of Health can immediately suspend the disclosure of information to that law enforcement agency or investigator. Secondly, the director of the Department of Health must annually review quarterly reports. We're going to require these people that are asking for this information to file quarterly reports regarding prior disclosures and essentially the impact and the outcome of those requests. The Director of Department of Health, in reviewing those quarterly reports, may make a determination that that access is being abused, not used properly, are simply not satisfied with the reasons for 
the requests or the uses that have been made of it. It's essentially an open-ended decision by the director. There's no need for the director to set up specific criteria. You have to provide notice and some articulable reason for it, but the director of the Department of Health will retain the authority to suspend and deny access to the system. We've also provided a civil penalty so that if it's abused, it provides for a civil action for award of damages and um, putative, punitive damages, I might add, and attorney's fees for violations. We also, as I said earlier, we do not want to do anything that will preclude somebody from seeking the help they need. We don't want somebody to think that because these limited law enforcement requests may show their name in a database somewhere, that they should refrain from seeking treatment. As a consequence, the prescription data from addiction treatment programs will not be accessible and not provided to any law enforcement agencies. The information doesn't provide social security numbers. It doesn't provide credit card information. It provides the very limited information of the prescriber, the prescription, and the patient's name will be provided, but on that limited basis. The bill, I think, strikes the proper balance between protecting privacy, protecting access to treatment, and giving us one more strategy to fight the opioid addiction epidemic in the state of Rhode Island. And it is for those reasons that I support this legislation in this format. Mr. President, thank you for the indulgence for allowing me to explain um, some of the details of the bill. Thank you, Senator Connolly. Senator Corkin. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, I do want to say that I do appreciate the intent of this bill. However, I rise in opposition. Um, the PDMP today contains information on a patient's name, their prescription, and the dosage. And unfortunately, there's nothing in this bill that states that that information would not be passed along to one of the people in those agencies without a warrant. Um, I just feel that this is crossing a line on the original intent of what the PDMP was intended, um, which was supposed to be used for physicians and pharmacists to make sure that there were no contraindications from prescriptions that patients were taking. And um, I also feel that uh, there are certain um, organizations that have spoken out against this, including the Rhode Island Chapter of American College of Physicians, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Leadership Council of Rhode Island, the Hospital Association of Rhode Island, and many others. And for those reasons, um, I have to oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Corker. Senator Golden. Thank you. I also rise in opposition to this bill. Um, like Senator uh, Conley, I too was very proud of the work that we have done as a General Assembly and particularly in the Senate to address the opioid crisis. I think it has been something that all of us would like to figure out a way to address and do what's best for our constituents and our own community um, and our friends. Um, unfortunately, this bill is a step uh, away from the policies that we set forth as the Senate last year when we viewed the opioid crisis as a mental health one. What this does is view it as a criminal, something that's criminal. And I am very concerned that not only about the privacy issues set up in this, but that we are changing the tone of the overall policy that we view as a state as important to address and tackle the opioid crisis that we have in this state. Um, and have been leading the country in very good policy making. This takes a shift away from that. You know, um, Senator Calkin men men mentioned some of the opponents of this, and um, there are 
I believe, 20 organizations that represent our medical community, our mental health, and our substance abuse community in the state who stand in opposition to this bill. Um, I realize we just amended it to to sunset it, and I want to explain also why I voted against that. I think this is bad precedent and policy, and sunsetting it as we have amended the bill to do so merely says that we'll allow for a few years to have bad policy. We have not even really allowed the bills that we passed last year into law to address the opioid epidemic. Um, we haven't really allowed those to do the work that we need to do and given them the time to address this issue from a mental health perspective. And so. I encourage you to think about that as you vote on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Golden. Senator Casada. I, I rise in opposition of this bill for the same reason, and I don't want to re repeat the same thing they already said. I really afraid, and I'm, a, you know, I'm very sad for all those families that he mentioned. They lost their family uh, with a drug uh, addiction. But at the same time, I'm afraid the minority community will be affected more than anybody else with this bill. And I don't think it's anybody who taking medication that is uh, a privacy for them, and that's the reason I completely will vote no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Casada. Is there further discussion on the act? Hearing none, the clerk will unlock the machine. If all senators have voted, the clerk will lock the machine. There are 21 votes in the affirmative, 14 in the negative, and the act passes. Leader Shikachi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At, at this time, I'd like to move the consent calendar, please. Leader Shikachi moves the consent calendar. That